Hey Culture Crew and welcome back to another exciting edition of Culture Kids Storytime. Before I even get into this story, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. I love being able to bring you this content and the more people that we have liking and subscribing, the more that I can do. So before we get into this story, I have to tell you, I have so much respect for Haitian people. A lot of times the world doesn't view the Haitians the way that they should and it's really, really sad. These are a group of very proud people with an amazing story. The world owes them so much and they don't get the respect that they deserve. The book that we're gonna read today is all about the first black republic, which was in Haiti. Let's check it out. Haiti is a beautiful country with a rich history located in the Caribbean. Thousands of years ago, the people that lived there were a group of Arawakian natives known as Taino, meaning good and noble. At that time, the Taino people called this island Aiti, the land of many mountains. The Taino people lived a simple life. They were skilled craftsmen who lived peacefully together in villages. They survived off of the land, planting, hunting, and fishing. They grew crops such as yucca, maize, peppers, and sweet potatoes. The Tainos enjoyed painting each other on their faces and bodies, singing folk songs, and performing dance ceremonies around fires for entertainment. They loved nature and did not believe in possessions. They believed that everything belonged to Mother Earth and the people that needed it. One day, in December 1492, a large ship arrived on the beaches of Haiti. On board the ship was a crew of men led by an explorer from the country of Spain named Christopher Columbus. His ship had been caught in the reef and became stranded. A group of Taino men eagerly rushed to Columbus to help haul the ship free. The friendly Tainos treated the Spaniards very kindly. Columbus had come to the island looking for gold. The Tainos led him and his men to parts of the island where gold was plentiful. Columbus loaded his ship with gold and other precious cargo to take back to Spain. Though he did not really discover the island, Columbus planted the Spanish flag in the soil and claimed the island for Spain and renamed it Hispaniola. Columbus left a group of Spanish people to build a fort called La Nivit, La Nivit, Na, Na Vida. Columbus left a group of Spanish people to build a fort called La Navida. The Spaniards took advantage of the Tainos and enslaved them. Most of the Tainos died from unfamiliar diseases brought back from Spain, as well as the labor they were forced to do. Between the years of 1492 and 1514, the population of Taina on the island fell from over 1 million people to less than 25,000. The island of Hispaniola was very rich and all the gold, treasures, and everything it had to offer were taken to the Kingdom of Spain. Other countries were noticing that Spain was thriving in their established colony of Hispaniola where the land was fertile and natural resources grew abundantly. In the early 1600s, European newcomers began to inhabit the northwestern part of the island. The number of French began to grow rapidly and they even started building plantations and growing crops. The Spanish and French began competing for control of the island, and in 1697, the Treaty of Ryswick was signed, and the French and Spanish agreed to divide the island of Hispaniola in two. The Spanish side would be called Santo Domingo, and the French side would be called Saint Domingue. As tobacco, coffee, and sugar production started to increase in Saint Domingue, the French colonists were in growing need of a labor force to work on the plantations. They started bringing in people from Africa and making them slaves. The French slave masters forced the Africans to work on plantations all over the colony. The French planters were very successful using this system and it made the slave masters very rich. At its peak, Saint Domingue provided two thirds of the world's sugar Saint Domingue became one of the world's most flourishing and wealthiest colonies. The French called Saint Domingue the Pearl of the Antilles. 
Even though the French planters were becoming wealthy from the land, the enslaved Africans were not happy. The work was very hard and many of the slave masters did not treat the slaves nicely. The slave masters did not pay the slaves for their work and gave them very little time to eat, drink, and rest. The slaves labored from sunup to sundown, cutting down sugar canes and harvesting the coffee and tobacco crops. The slave masters would beat the slaves to make them work harder and intimidate the other workers. As a result, since most of the slaves did not survive the beatings and harsh treatment, the slave masters were always replenishing the amount of laborers by enslaving more Africans to keep the plantation system profitable. Many of the slaves ran away from the plantation because they were being treated so badly by their slave masters. Most of them would hide in the mountains so that they would not be found. The slaves that escaped to the mountains were called Maroons. One of the most famous Maroons was called Mackendal. Mackendal fled towards the mountains and he persuaded a lot of other slaves to join him. Soon he convinced thousands of slaves to fight against the injustice of slavery. Mackendal was not satisfied with the few thousand Maroons who escaped the bad treatment of the slave masters. He wanted freedom for all the slaves of St. Domingue. Mackendal organized an army from the Maroons in the mountains and created a plan to defeat the slave masters and free all the slaves. He led his army of Maroons at night and raided different plantations on the island, liberating thousands of slaves. The slave masters would sometimes catch him, but he would always escape. Then one night he was captured and he could not escape. Even though he was captured, Mackendal swore to the slave masters that one day all the slaves of St. Domingue would be free. 33 years after Mackendal was captured, the slaves were still working and being mistreated on the plantations of St. Domingue under the brutal whip of the French slave masters. It was around this time that a slave named Dutty Bookman, brought from the island of Jamaica, started what would become the biggest slave revolt in the history of the world. Bookman was a spiritual man. On August 14, 1791, Bookman conducted a secret ceremony along with the Mambo Cecil Fatima in a thickly wooded area under the tree of Boys Cayman, in which he inspired the slaves to take action. They laid out detailed plans for defeating the French and setting all the slaves on the island free. After the ceremony, slaves on plantations all over the north of St. Domingue began to rise up against their slave masters. They burned the plantations to the ground and fought back against their oppressors. The slaves would band together and go from plantation to plantation, freeing other slaves and defeating their masters. Even though Bookman did not survive the fighting, he became one of the greatest heroes of what will go down in history as the Haitian Revolution. When the French government heard about the slave revolt in St. Domingue, they sent 10,000 French soldiers to the island to crush the rebellion. Even though Bookman was killed, the revolt was still going on. But in order to truly defeat the French and bring freedom to the slaves, the rebels needed a new leader. The leader that would emerge was an ex-slave named Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint joined the revolution as a doctor, but quickly rose to the top of the ranks to lead the revolutionary army. Toussaint was a brilliant leader. He could read and write, which was something most of the slaves could not do. Toussaint organized and trained the rebel army on how to properly fight against the experienced French army. He was also a great speaker who motivated and inspired the rebels in times of despair. Toussaint led the revolutionary army along with his top officers Jean Jacques de Salanes and Henri Christophe. He led them to victory after victory over the French army. In 1794, the French suffered great losses and they had no other choice but to abolish slavery and free all the slaves of St. Domingue. Toussaint was made governor general of the colony and protected the island from foreign powers such as Spain and England for many years to come. He became the most powerful man in St. Domingue from 1794 to 1802. Toussaint's achievements during his years in power include social reforms, structuring and organizing a new government, establishing courts of justice, and building public schools. In 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte came into power in France 
and two years later sent a force of 20,000 soldiers on 86 warships to St. Domingue led by his brother-in-law, General Charles Leclerc, to take over the colony and reinstitute slavery. Toussaint was tricked into a meeting with Leclerc where he was captured and put on a boat to France. Toussaint warned his captors with this phrase, in overthrowing me, you have done no more than cut down the trunk of the tree of black liberty in St. Domingue. It will spring back from the roots, for they are numerous and deep. Napoleon locked Toussaint up in a prison high in the French Alps called Fort de Jour, where he would spend the remaining days of his life. Toussaint Louverture passed away from malnutrition and pneumonia on April 7, 1803. The fight for freedom had started again. There were many fierce battles between the rebel army and Napoleon's army. General Leclerc and thousands of his soldiers were stricken with yellow fever and lost their lives. The rebel army used this fever as an opportunity to gain the upper hand in the war. November 18, 1803 would be one of the most famous battles. In this war of independence, the Battle of Verteris, Leclerc's successor, General Ranchambo, desperately tried to hang on to one of the French's army's few remaining strongholds, Fort Verteris. However, General Desalanes, along with General Francois Capos, led the charge that would not only defeat the French once and for all, but to rid St. Domingue of slavery forever. After winning the Battle of Vateris, General de Solanes was successful in forcing the French army to complete surrender and leave the island. On January 1st, 1804, de Solanes signed the Haitian Declaration of Independence, which made St. Domingue the first independent nation in the Caribbean, the second democracy in the Western Hemisphere, and the very first black republic in the world. He renamed the former French colony Haiti as a tribute to the original Taino people who inhabited the island hundreds of years ago. So here are some important dates for you to remember. So in 1492, Columbus lands on Haiti and renames it Hispaniola, Little Spain. In 1697, the Treaty of Ryswick is signed and Spain cedes the western part of Hispaniola to France. The French names its territory Saint Domingue. In 1750s, the Mackendal Rebellions happen. In 1791, Bookman's secret ceremony beginning the slave revolts happens. And then in 1794, France abolishes slavery in all of their colonies. In 1796, Toussaint Louverture is point, appointed commander in chief of Saint Domingue and later becomes governor general. In 1802, Napoleon sends the French army to invade Saint Domingue and reinstitute slavery. In 1802, Toussaint Louverture is captured and sent to a French prison. In 1803, the Battle of Vateris, General Jean Jacques de Salanis and Francois Capos are immortalized. In 1804, Jean Jacques de Salanis declared an independent Haiti. So 1804 is a huge day for Haitian people. That is so significant because that was the turning point that really established their freedom as an independent black nation. Okay, in this next section, we're gonna talk about the did you knows. So in 1915, the United States invaded Haiti and occupied the country for 19 years. The occupation also met resistance by rebel leaders like Charlemagne Perlete. Frederick Douglass was the United States ambassador to Haiti from 1889 through 1891. In 1825, Haiti was forced to pay an indemnity to France in the amount of 160 million francs comparable to $40 billion in 2010 currency. For loss of property being the slaves, it would take over Haiti over 100 years to pay. Even though it was paid in full, the effect of the debt has crippled Haiti's economy to this day. Now here's something really, really important you have to understand. The French went to Haiti. 
They stole the land from the people. They took Africans and they forced them into slavery to work on the plantations. So they never paid these people for working on the plantations. They never paid them for all of the pain and suffering that they went through. These people got sick of their mess and said, you know what? I'm not gonna take this anymore and I'm gonna fight back. When they fought back and they got their freedom from the French, the French were angry that they lost money. The money that they were getting off of the backs of our people. So what did they do? They said to Haiti, if you want to be recognized throughout the rest of the world, you have to pay us $40 billion so that we can get the money back that we would have made if we would have had you people as slaves. So think about that for a minute. You've got a group of people that have forced you to do something you didn't want to do. They've hurt you. They've caused so much destruction. Generations of people in your families are suffering because of what they did, but they still have the nerve to come and take more away from you. That is what has been done to the Haitian people. They are constantly being bombarded by all of these people wanting to take from them. The more that they have, the more that they want to take. So they have completely ravaged this land of all of its natural resources, the gold, the fertile soil that's making, you know, um, abundant crops that they can sell throughout the world. So the French took advantage of these people and they still did it up until recently. So Haiti finally paid off this bill and now their country is in ruins because they cannot support themselves economically. This is the most disrespectful display ever. And it goes to show you the will of these people, why they deserve so much more than the world is giving them. So then, in 1805, the king of North Haiti, Henry Christoph, began construction of the citadel to keep Haiti safe from European invaders. The massive fort required 20,000 workers and over 15 years to complete. To this day, the citadel is the largest fortress in the Western Hemisphere on one of Haiti's top tourist attractions. After Haiti defeated France in the Revolutionary War, Napoleon gave up on his plans for Western domination, leading to the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the United States. So why this is important is the state of Louisiana was once owned by the French. It was part of the French territories or colonies or whatever you want to call it. It was right smack in the middle of the United States as we know it today. So had Napoleon not been fighting with Haiti, he wouldn't have needed money to fund the war that he was fighting with Haiti, and he would not have sold that land to the United States. So the United States would look very, very different than it does today. So the United States government actually owes Haiti a lot of respect and a debt because had it not been for the war that they were fighting with the French at the time, we would not have Louisiana. And that really increased the size of the United States during that period of time. That increased the wealth, that increased the resources, etc. So not only do American people owe Haiti respect, the French owe Haiti respect for all of the things that they've had to endure at the backs of at the hands of french people so then you go into the leaders of the three largest slavery revolts in the united states were gabriel prosser which was in 1800 nat turner which was 1822 and denmark vesey in 1831 these were all inspired by the success of the haitian revolution so why that's significant is you have the Haitian people who have said enough is enough. We're fighting back, we're gonna get our freedom, we're going to be a sovereign state, we're going to own our own destiny. Well, word gets back to other slaves that are in the United States. Word starts to travel, people are talking, they're like, whoa, Haiti is free. They fought back and got their freedom. We need to start doing the same thing. 
we aren't gonna stay here and take this anymore either. So then you had pockets of black people within the United States who were then fighting back the slave masters and they're saying, we're done. We're not gonna keep dealing with this. We're not gonna keep putting up with this behavior from you. And they're fighting back so that they could get their freedom just like the Haitians did. That was all by design because the Haitian people showed them how to do it. You had to band together, you had to come together, you had to have a common goal versus being off on your own in silos and kind of doing different things that are happening. So all of these lessons that we use today came from Haiti. We owe them so much. We owe them our the 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 freedoms that we we have now. They were the blueprint for what we see today. And that is why I say I have so much respect for the Haitian people. One thing that this book kind of highlighted and went over is that, you know, um Mac and Dow was having these these different um spiritual meetings so the significance behind that and they don't talk about this much so i'm giving you a little known history fact here our people did different spiritual workings and within those spiritual workings they would call on the energies of the trees and the grass and things around them and they would call on these spirits and these ancestors to come and aid them so that they were able to drive back the oppressors and they were able to drive back these people that wanted to continue to beat them and treat them in the wrong ways so they got the energy and strength because they had these african traditions that brought out the warrior spirit in them each of us black people have this warrior spirit within us and it's our decision whether or not we want that to come to the surface. So the Haitians harnessed that energy and they were able to drive back the French. The French were not prepared for these very ill-equipped, as they would say, black people to be so effective in beating them off. They weren't ready for that, okay? This was something that completely confused and baffled them because they thought we were savages. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know how to deal with civilized society. We didn't know how to read and write, but we at the core are creative people. We figure out a way out of no way. That is why, that is why to this day, we are successful in different things that we do because we think outside of the box. Everything that we do, a lot of us, sometimes you have intuition. Something will come to you and you're like, I don't even know where that came from and I don't know why, but I need to do this one thing right now. And you doing that thing makes you super successful. That is your ancestors, that is your intuition, that is your ability to tap into hidden knowledge that is hidden within your DNA and that is what the Haitian people were showing us. So I hope you enjoyed this book. I get really passionate when I talk about these things because this is our story, you guys. This, this is our story. This is what matters for us to know about our culture and our upbringing and the importance and significance that our ancestors fought for. And so we need to take it upon ourselves to know this information. So please, again, like, subscribe, and I hope to see you next time on Culture Kids Storytime. Take care.